So just so you guys know, a um, little bit of background about me before I get started is um, my name is James Patrick, and I became well obsessed with Ableton Live like probably everyone else in this room. For me, it was when version 2 came out. I had a mentor um, that tipped me off to it, and it really turned me on because I'm not formally musically trained. I just was a DJ for my whole life and just wanted to kind of touch sound in the same way that a DJ does, and I didn't want to necessarily play scales on my piano i wanted to make music that no one had ever imagined before so back in the 90s this was called techno nowadays it's called other things but um so i made a ton of that you can find me on beatport and all that junk uh james patrick hi but more importantly about 10 years ago i started an ableton certified training center called slam academy and it's in minneapolis and it is literally the dopest place you can learn ableton in the world and we have a really legit super intensive sound design course and that's really one of our flagship courses so check us out slam academy and what i'm going to do is i'm going to show off like one of the many many techniques we teach in that pl at that place but this is going to be about starting with a simple sound idea and turning it into a pile of sounds for your sound library that are nice and solid and clear and loud and professional sounding so i got my ableton up and i got a midi track and an audio track we're pretty much gonna start this thing by grabbing a midi track and opening up our browser it's option command b if you're not sure and i could just hit command f and type simpler an arrow down and enter that's going to load a simpler onto my available midi track a quick workflow that i can teach you if you didn't already know is instead of doing that i can just go to find a sound in my browser like maybe i'm going to find a kick drum sound or a clap so i'm going to grab this clap and if i go up to the empty midi track and hit shift tab i can drag the midi drag the audio clip down into the MIDI device window, and that will assume that I'm trying to put that into a sampler. That's a simple little trick that a lot of people don't know. Another one that a lot of people don't know is this. This sampler holds one sound at a time. Pardon me, simpler holds one sound at a time. But if I right click on it, I can change it into the sampler with a capital S. And this is the far more powerful multi-sampling instrument. And what this allows me to do now is open up my zones tab and I can put as many sounds as I want into this one instrument. This is insanely powerful. So the technique I'm going to show you now is I'm going to make a library full of like impact sounds. Maybe they could be used as like drums or they're like one shots. Let's make a library of one shots that are all kind of like morphing. And uh, maybe let's focus on something like crunches or zaps, some sort of impact. I got a clap in there already. I mean, I could just listen to it quick. It's a little clap in there. You probably heard that through the listen to audio movers. Give me a give me a thumbs up. Did you hear that? Sweet. So now what I want to do is I want to think about my soundscape that I'm about to create. Not like as I'm thinking about notes, but instead think about the frequency spectrum. You guys know this device. This is an audio effect in live called the spectrum. This allows me to hit a note and I can like see where all the information is. You know what I mean? So now what I can do is I can go back to that zones tab and find some sounds that fill up other spots. I'm going to layer a bunch of sounds in this sampler. So when I hit a note, I'm going to hear, I'm going to hear a nice big cake full of information. So maybe I'll start with some bass sounds and then some mid range and then some high frequency sounds. Let me just open my browser and I'm just going to go right into my drums folder like I did before. And let's try like a bass drum or some sort of kick drum or something. I'm just going right into my factory sounds for Ableton and just seeing what I can find. Cool, here's a big old bass drum kick. That's kind of cool. I'm just grabbing random sounds. Here's a crunchy kick. So now I got a couple kicks and a clap. Let's listen to that. So see now when I look at my spectrum, I got bass now too. I got some punchy mid-range and I got some crunchies. And right? Let's open that zones tab and see what else we can add. I was thinking about adding some like sustainy pitching sounds or what about like some electricity sounds? I'm just going to type command F on my keyboard and I'm going to type electricity and I've got some electricity sounds here. Let's check this out. Sweet electricity. I know you can't hear that, but I'm going to drop that in too. Let's listen to it all together now. So now I have these impacts and then I have the sustaining electricity sound. You know, this is just random layering of sounds into the zones tab of the sampler. Cool. Let's keep going. Let's add another one. How about a cymbal crash? 
I'm just going to type symbol wave because that's going to narrow down all my symbol sounds and get rid of all the instrument racks and effects and just give me wave files. Reverse symbols could be cool. Big old delay symbols. Cool. Let's grab a symbol or two. How about two of them? Look, now when I hit a note, we're going to just hear all sorts of bullshit coming out of this instrument. You know, my spectrum. Oh, yeah, it's so it's over. Right. My range got jacked one quick sec. I don't know if you guys use the Spectrum device, but this is a really cool device for looking at your signal. And one thing it'll do by default is it'll be an auto scaling mode where the decibels, like the Y axis is scaling all the time. So see how like it's getting narrower and narrower and narrower. That's kind of annoying sometimes. So what you can do is you can switch it from auto to a fixed range. And then this is your decibel range. And especially for mixing and mastering or sound design, this is pretty sweet. So let's say maximum is negative zero and then minimum is like negative 100. Like that's a pretty normal range. And now my shadow stays locked in there. So when I hit a sound, you know, everything stays fixed and I can really see what I'm working with. So now I have this singular sound that's like all these layers of shit going on. You guys feel what I'm saying right now? So what I can do now to make this actually interesting is I can go to the sample tab, the next tab over. You know, I've got some sounds in there. That's cool. I'm going to go to the sample tab and I'm going to take a look. And now what I can do is I can maybe make some of these sounds loop. I can choose them all here. Let's go to the clap and maybe make this thing loop. Maybe go to the next sound and make this thing loop too. We'll loop the kick drum. That'll be cool. Let's hold this down and see what this sounds like. Now it's like kind of a wind down, like explosion. That's kind of cool. I could automate the loop length and stuff. I don't know. Let's go to the next sound. We're just looping some of these things so they kind of just play forever. Let's play the, pull this way in. Nice. Now I have some kind of smearing bass crunchy shit in there. These are all ideas. You know, maybe that maybe that one. This is the crunchy kick. Yeah, those are cool. Let's do the electricity. We'll have that one loop too, but that can just be like whatever, some permanent loop that just goes forever. Notice how in the sampler I'm able to use forward stop, forward forward, or forward reverse. These are all different looping modes that are awesome and that don't exist in the simpler. Let's check our next symbol crash. The symbol crash is maybe we can just keep on there. So let's see it now. Let's check it out. Sweet. So now I have this like kind of car crash sound. It sounds like two spaceships that collided, and you know. So now let's start. Let's start gluing these layers all together. I'm going to go to the next tab, and I'm going to go to the oscillator tab. For fans of the Ableton operator, there's basically an Ableton operator FM modulator built into the sampler, and this is one of the dopest things about this whole instrument. So now what I can do is I can grab a waveform straight out of my Ableton operator. Triangle wave is juice for the fm check that triangle wave and then go ahead and just crank this up and it's going to just destroy the sound and then we'll be able to tune it to find some cool weird kind of dystopian metallic texture to add to this thing so here it's all noisy but here when we crank this up into space so we're just getting into crazy land let's put a little envelope on there So now we've got a little amount for our FM over time. Let's take that envelope and we're going to put it in trigger mode. Trigger mode is a thing you can do with envelopes in any synthesizer. And what it does is it stops worrying about how long you're sustaining the note for. It just fires it off and the whole envelope decays the way it's supposed to, regardless of how you hold the note down for. So I'm doing that to my FM oscillator, but I'm also going to go to the global tab and do that to my master envelope here. And the global tab is where my master kind of VCA envelope is. And by putting this in trigger mode and pulling the sustain level all the way down, I can pluck a note. And I've just got this nice splashing attack thing. Play it on my push. So this is now just like a big old weird cake of sounds. And here's where this gets actually pretty fun. Take the filter and pull that low pass filter down nice and low. So now it's just going to be like kind of some more sine wavy bassy shit. Ooh, you know, that's all you get. And then flip the filter into morphing mode. This is some tight shit. I mentioned morphing sounds. So now you have this morph control that'll basically expose your claps, your clap layers or your electricity and cymbal layers or just the bass drum layers. 
So now this thing is like a little whip that we can control across the sound. And we can go to the next tab, the modulation tab, turn on the aux envelope, and you probably guessed it, modulate the filter morph. This is an additional envelope, the third envelope, and so we're going to go ahead and also put this into trigger mode. So that means we can pluck a note and it'll just play the whole thing. And now we have a shape that can morph us from low pass to band pass to high pass to notch. So we can decide how far we want to go through those different filter modes right here. And now when we pluck a note, we'll be able to kind of take the sound on a little bit of a tone journey. You know, and you can even look closely and be like, okay, after about one second, it gets up to a high pass, and then it takes seven or eight more seconds to get down to a band pass. Yeah, here, I'll keep it, keep it low, maybe. Make the decay a little bit longer. Can even make a new shape here like this. Try making a logarithm instead of an exponential curve. This is pretty cool. So this is all right, you know, and right now we're kind of just f making variations on shape on a single morphing sound. You can hear how that decay and sustain is controlling the overall kind of filter morph. And one other thing I want to do with that filter, and this can be really great for gluing the layers together. We use the FM oscillator to glue the layers together, but let's also use the built-in shaper. This is really tasty for kind of compressing all your sounds together. You can put it before the filter or after. After is good if you want to hear the distortion of the, of the shaper. In this case, I'm going to put it before the filter because I just want to saturate the filter a little bit. And then I might even make the filter move a little too. Let's trigger this envelope. Now this is our fourth envelope that's all in trigger mode. And this can be a shape for moving around that filter cutoff. Cool, so this is getting somewhere now. You know, like when they make sounds for the Transformer movie, they don't just make one crunch. They make like a library full of crunches. And they're all subtly different. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to our next tab. And we're going to go to LFO 3, and we're going to put this LFO into an, our sample and hold shape, like a random shape, and we're going to slow it way down. So now, and if it's in re-trigger mode, every new note I play is going to randomize whatever these targets are. And a couple really fun targets to randomize are over global time because that's going to affect all of our envelopes. So now some of these will be shorter and some will be longer. Let's try it out. Hear these variations. So now what I can do is I can go to the MIDI clip and I can say, yeah, new note, every bar. Just a little click because all those envelopes are in trigger mode, right? Here we go. Maybe I'll go with two bars. That's kind of a long sound. <laughs> Yeah, so we can tweak our little envelope now. And we just got this kind of really dynamic sound generation machine. And we have another, el another element we could randomize. I was thinking the FM oscillator's pitch. So we'll get different FM frequencies every time. That can be a really cool one too. Oh yeah, that's cool. So, so there's all sorts of cool shit going on in here. Let's modulate the filter cut out here. Nah. So you want more random, you can just keep evoking a little more random. Let's do one more re-triggered slow sample and hold circuit. And this one's going to go to the LFO amount to the filter cutoff. So I'll say LFO one amount filter. There's another cool parameter to randomize. So sometimes we'll get a little wobble. Sometimes we won't. Nice. So, okay. So now that we've got some nice variations on our sound happening, the cool thing is we can keep adding sounds or taking sounds away. I've had great time adding like acapellas to this, anything that can put the sound in some sort of experimental dimension. 
especially when that morphing filter moves around. It's uncovering and covering up. It's like a curtain that's covering and uncovering different layers of the sound. So that can just be pretty profound. Um, so the next little step that I usually like to tell people to do is it's recorded for a little while. So this is a another kind of essential workflow of a sound designer is just resampling. So I can grab a new audio track and I can take the audio from it's option command I to show that IO section and I can just I can record from resampling the nice thing about using resampling instead of direct from the track is that with resampling I can uh, I'm capturing any effects that are on my returns and my master channel so maybe I want to have a little spectral delay on there or distortion I can start adding that with my returns and that's all going to get captured one other thing before I record this though, I think I want to add a little bit of audio effects to it, a little bit of saturation and compression. So here's a little standard channel strip. If you're not sure about how to get how to make your sound sound better quickly with audio effects, here's the simple kind of age-old Grammy winning workflow. You start with subtractive EQ and you get rid of unnecessary frequencies, especially the low, low end. Then you do some compression. I'm just going to do the clean Ableton compressor because we start with frequency and then we do amplitude. And I'm not going to necessarily, I don't know, this is an electronic music sound, obviously. It's not trying to sound like a violin or anything, so I might compress this really hard. Let's listen to it. You can hear it really bringing out all those little bits. If I want to have more attack on the sound, like more punch, I'd slow that attack way right down on my compressor. That's really going to maximize the blast and the impact of the sound by slowing that attack way down. Sometimes I'll have it up all the way to like six or 700 milliseconds, and then the compressor is only grabbing on and compressing the, the quiet parts of the sound and leaving the transients alone. So this is another really cool sound design combo, cutting the bass and then adding some punch. Usually after that, honestly, with sound design, you can, one compressor is never enough with sound design, you guys. Instead of working the one compressor too hard, just work it a little bit and then use another secondary compressor. If this compressor here is adds punch, I just duplicate it and make this more of a peak limiter. And the peak limiter, honestly, I'd probably put before the adds punch and this would not be slow, but be fast and just grabbing the tops. So look now, I've got a peak limiter pushing down the very top peaks while I've got a slow attack adds punch with a really low threshold right after it. These three now are a really good sound design combo. But wait, there's more. After the compression, so you got frequency and amplitude. What's the third dimension of sound? Frequency, amplitude. Pizza? Awesome, cool. Uh, five points to... Um, Smarty pants, timbre. Uh, so check it out. Time to add some timbre. Great devices for adding timbre and sound design in Ableton. I mean, there's a pile of them, but honestly, the drum bus is great. The saturator is great. The glue compressor in soft clip mode is essential. These are all like totally dope tools you can use. Let's let's go ahead and do a little saturator and then a little drum bus. Drum bus. It's not just for drums. <laughs> Okay, sorry if that blew your heads off. Turn the output gain down. Yeah, see how I can drive this now? And in fact, I gotta pull my compressor, my ads punch output gain down a little bit so I'm not hitting it quite so hard. There we go. You can see the little line in the sand there. That's when the limiter can kick in if you want a little limiter on there. That can be nice for sound design too for getting maximum compression. I got my I got my drum bus on there. A cool trick with the drum bus that most people don't know is that the idea with the drum bus is if you have all these turned down, it's not doing anything. <clears throat> it's actually not true though. <clears throat> it's still coloring the signal depending on how much trim is going in. So one thing I like to do if I have a nice loud signal is I'll have all these turned all the way down, and then I open the dampening all the way up, and then I'll tweak these transient shaper. And this can be really nice for getting getting for kind of customizing the attack and the punch of the sound. Now I need to turn the gain up. Remember, it's all based on the trim. If I have all these turned down and the signal going in is really quiet, you won't hear it. There we go. It 
Let's add a little drive for a little compression. A so solid state distortion. Nice, so now we've got frequency, amplitude, and timbre all baked together. And normally the fourth dimension to cover and to find a proper sound design channel strip is dimension, like stereo image, because now you've got two ears, of course. So this might happen with a chorus or a phaser or a delay. I'm really careful about putting time-based effects on samples for a sample library, though. If I'm going to, it's going to be really small sounds, like a really tiny delay with a really small amount of millisecond time to make it more like a flanger. I'm not going to put like big, wet sound time-based effects on a sample pack very often. It's pretty unorthodox to have a sample pack that's all drenched in reverb. I want to keep that shit pretty dry. So anyway, let's go ahead and uh, play around with make a little kind of flanger style delay. In fact, if you're familiar with the Haas effect, this is a classic stereo imaging technique you can try. <clears throat> Pull that dry wet mix back a little bit. Don't have too much feedback, probably none. And then offset the left and right channels by about 15 milliseconds. That's going to give you this perceived kind of stereo image. And it's really common to not want to do that to the bass. So you guys probably already know this trick, but maybe you don't. Um, to apply an effect only to a certain part of the spectrum, it's pretty slick. You can just grab that device and hit Command G. You know, that's going to throw it into the old audio effect rack, and this is probably review for a lot of you ninjas. But now I can grab an EQ3, and I can put it on the chain in front of the delay, and I can mute the low end. Now I can take that same EQ, EQ3 with an option drag or alt drag on the PC and on this lows chain that doesn't have the delay obviously I'm going to unmute the bass and get rid of the highs. So now I just have this nice sub bass chain that's just bass and I can even further process that. Really awesome thing to do to just the bass is put a little overdrive on there and fatten that low end up. Maybe back the tone off, put the mix all the way in. And now I've got some thicker low end, and here's my high end with this super stereo image. So now I've got this beautiful ability to balance my low end and my high end. So I turn those highs down by 13 dB, and now it's starting to sound really cool to me. Let's try it again. Nice. Yeah, so this is the thing. So now that I've got that thing all juiced up and nice and loud, let's double check our levels before we do any recording, make sure we're not in the reds and make sure it's loud enough. I can just mute my track, reset my meters right here and just hit play. And look, I'm coming up to 0.78 above. So I'd probably just to be a proper G to make sure I'm not overloading anywhere. I'd go to my previous gain stage and turn that down a little bit just to make sure I'm not peaking at zero. So here on now I'm peaking at 0.97. One dB a headroom, nice and pro. Is with me on that? Because you don't want to be all overloaded when you record it, that's ghetto too, right? So now that I'm recording from resampling, I mean, I'm not even using my returns or master, so maybe I'll just bring it in direct from the sampler. And I'm armed to record and now I can just hit record. Oh, I should probably unmute my microphone. So remember my MIDI clip is two bars long. It's going to be important to remember that for our next workflow. Just letting this play for a sec. <laughs> While it's playing, we can totally get in there and gnarly some of these up if we want. Let's see, let's head back into the sampler. All those water droplets and shit in there. Cool, so let's call that good. Look what I got now. Now I've got a whole pile of iterations on that same sound idea. So now all I got to do is turn this into a sample library full of one shots. So if you only caught one single workflow of this whole demonstration, this is the one. Are you ready? Because I know you guys probably know how to make cool sounds. 
quickly turning them into a sample pack that sounds great is kind of a trick. So watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna grab this clip and I'm gonna tab over to the arrangement view. I drop this track onto the arrangement view. I can go back to arrangement on the clip right here. And here comes the workflow. I'm gonna rename this clip, step one. I'm gonna hit Command R and I'm gonna call this um, uh, Laser Blasts Two Bar. How about Layered Laser Blasts? That's better. The more uniqueness you can, the better. And notice my, my naming methodology, no spaces, no symbols, capital on the first letter of each word. Plus mention the length, the key, and uh, if there is a key, which of course this, there's no key here, but then also the tempo usually helps. Especially if it's a loop, you gotta obviously have the tempo in there. So now that I've got that labeled, I can do this guys. Here's another sound design trick. I wonder if I could make this clip any louder. Remember how I was peaking at 0.9 dB? I could normalize this file. You know, my friend who works at Ableton didn't know this trick and I told him the other day and this shit's been around forever. But if you click on this clip, you can hit command J and that's gonna consolidate, but it also happens to normalize your audio files. Oh, so now that I've done this, I can look and see that I had 0.46 dB of headroom on my recording. So I can click on this volume slider and hit delete. And that gives me back any additional headroom that was available in the recording. So essentially I just normalized the recording and by hitting command J, I rendered a new one. So it got rid of the resampled recording and it applied the new name and the date to all the files. Now, here's where the ninja shit comes out. I got my shurikens out. You ready for this? So now remember my, my sounds are two bars long. I'm going to take my grid resolution and I'm going to hit command two and change that to two bars. So now I can click on the file and use my arrow keys left to right and command E to split up my recording into one, two bar chunks. Command E, right. Command E, right. And I'm just going back and forth hitting arrow right, command E. It's a little bit of a dance you got to do on the keyboard and it's not very sexy. There will be a right click option for this soon, I'm sure. But now that I've got that all chopped up, I can highlight all of those and I can right click on one of them and choose crop clips. This will once again now bake all new samples out of those sounds that I edited. And as long as I have in the record warp launch tab, auto fade clip edges, create fades on clip edges turned on, that's gonna automatically put a little three or four millisecond crossfade on the end of my samples because I put the command E split on there. So command E breaks them up but also puts a little crossfade on there for you when you, when you crop them if you have that parameter turned on. So now check it out, we're almost done. So now what I can do is I can go to one of my sounds and I can right click on it and I can show it in the finder. This would say reveal in Explorer if I was on a Windows machine. And now look at my sound library. I've got this big directory full of crop sounds. Here's the, here we go, now I come up to the search by. I might need to hit command two if I'm in some like dumb OSX search field window. Command two will bring me into the rows mode and then I can go to the kind. I can right click and show kind. And by clicking there on kind, it'll parse out all the ASD files. If you guys know what those are, the Ableton sample data files, that's all Ableton's metadata to remember the warp marker positions and shit. We don't want any of that. We just want the AFES, the, the high res audio, right? So now that I sorted by kind, I can click on one and shift click on the next. And if I'm on a Mac, I can control click and even rename all of them and do a bulk formatting of all the names if I want. So this would be a cool way I could be like, okay, these are called layered laser blasts two bar and I could hit enter and it would rename them all in sequential order for me. Now, since I renamed the clip with command R before hitting command J to normalize them all, I don't really need to do that because I already got my perfect names in there, right? But if I did want to, like say I don't want the dates on there, you know, like the dates, why? So I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to grab one of these things and copy it. Yeah. And now we're going to re-grab all these and control click. We're going to get rid of the dates. We're going to hit rename. And then I'll say, 
This will start you off on replace text. You're gonna switch it to format. And again, this is Mac only. If you're on a PC, there are free software apps that will do this for you. But I'm gonna change the name and index. I'm just gonna paste right here everything but that stupid date. I mean, actually the date is pretty cool for my own personal use, but if I'm gonna share this sample library with the world, I don't want to say the date that I made them. I just wanted to say the name of the sound. So I put that on there and I start at number one and I hit rename and look at this sexy business. Boopity boop, names them all for me. That's some shit though. So now what I gotta do, pardon my bad language, it's late. So now look, what now what I do guys is I go over to my Ableton and I open my browser and you probably already know what I do now. I go to that user library because this is where I keep all my personalized content and I go into my samples folder. You're going to have your own folders up here probably, but everyone's got a samples folder and I highly recommend putting your own folders in there. I'm going to look here. These are kind of crunches. I could put them in crunches. I've got some morph wubs, modular one shots, modular blasts. You know, I could put these wherever. I think I'm going to go with crunches. I got squishies. Mm. Okay, let's go with, oh, here's zaps. Yeah. I'm going to open my zaps folder, and I'll even make a new folder in here. And I'm, because organizing is, this is the secretary part of class. I warned you ahead of time. Sorry. So I'm going to make a new folder. What do we call these? Laser, bla liquid laser blasts. What was that? I can't remember already. Layered laser blasts. Two bar, right? So now I just grab them and drop them on in. Look at all those nice, nicely named, normalized and cross-faded, perfectly cut two bar samples. And if I, I mean, if I did, then feel crazy. I could just, you know. I got a cool like reggae jam we can put on. <laughs> now you've got sounds to drop into your tracks that are actually yours, you know? And not just sounds you found on Splice. And these are just sounds I found in my factory library, but they don't sound like it anymore, do they? I don't know, it's just an idea. So I'm gonna see, I've got this uh, projects folder. I'm gonna go ahead and put this, call this uh, sample pack creation demo. Ableton user group, Kansas. Boop. And that's going to, of course, save them in my sound library as well for backup, just by saving it there. That's slick. And um, I'll delete the ones I don't want to keep. So yeah, this is your, this is the art of being a sound designer. It's like, I used to think it was about being good at MIDI sequencing and using a VST and a synthesizer, but that's just songwriting. Production is working with audio. You know, you write the song with the MIDI tracks and stuff. That's cool. But once it's on the timeline... Delete one or two of them and have a real human play the instrument. Or just resample them to audio and then get in there with the fucking microscope. Like if you want to make music that sounds like really compelling and intriguing at every single moment, you can't just it can't just be like MIDI chords on a MIDI piano. Even if you really tweak that synth patch really nicely, if you resample or freeze and flatten that track and then micro edit that audio file, that's when you're going to get into the really, really tight sounding music and your music is going to start sounding really well produced. So this is why I like just making audio files. You know, look at my laser la layered laser blasts. Sick, man. I'm going to throw that in the beginning of my track. It's like, haven't you ever wanted a cool sound effect? Like at that moment when the track is getting boring, it's like now I got one and I made it myself and I was just jerking around, but I'm going to just slide my little Sonarworks plug-in um, after your thing. And here comes you. I'll give you a link out of log and we can listen to a track just to wipe this out. While we're listening to it, I'll find a couple other spots to throw some laser blasts. This is probably, this song probably doesn't really need laser blasts, but let's, let's see what happens. I'm going to duplicate and reverse that one. Yeah. Some reggae shit. Oh, well, refresh your. Let me let me double check my plug too. Sometimes sometimes you gotta um, hit Command R if I'm opening and closing a session. Otherwise, I will repaste the link. Especially if anyone just showed up recently, you will want that to get that full res. You know, actually, yeah. And you know what? Reggae is cool, but I think you guys are you guys are all into electronic music, right? Or what kind of music do you like? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm skipping the reggae one and I'm going to go with the more <clears throat> crazy, crazy shit track. 
What's that? Yep, here comes the link one sec. I think I was about to do that, and then I, in fact, you know what I got to do? I'm going to get a new, brand new one for you since I'm closing this session anyway. So hold tight, and then we'll listen to a couple minutes of a track, and then you guys can think of any weird questions you have to ask me. Sweet. Um, but yeah, by the way, reggae is fun. You should make some sometime. If you're learning how to be a producer, just pick a genre and just figure out how to make it. Something that's really tried and true, like reggae, is a great choice, especially because tons of the modern production techniques that we use in bass music and everything are all adopted from reggae. So like turning the mixer into an instrument and resampling to make new sounds, as well as having concise beats that are minimal. But, you know, there's like, there's a reason why they call it dubstep. And it's not just because it's like 70 beats per minute. Okay, so here comes a track in a sec once I share that link. Thanks for your patience and thanks for listening to me rant all day. Here comes live and direct. And a sec in the chat and then post the chat. Come on, you piece of shit. And I'm taking the time. All right. It's like watching Grandpa program his VCR. I'm trying to record my shows. I'm trying to record uh, The Young and the Restless. <laughs> oh, is that my boy, Bard? Hey, Bard, what's up, dude? Dude, we just did a sample pack creation workflow. Um, yeah, and it was real fun. We made some crazy impact laser blast sounds out of some various random shit I found in my library. And now, um, now we're going to listen to a track, and I'm going to start throwing those sounds all over it. <laughs> We're just what's that? Yep. Absolutely. Thanks for good the questions. Bring them. Nothing more boring than sitting in your bedroom talking to a chunk of metal. You know, this when you ask me, then it makes me feel like you're a little human in that thing. So check it out. All you got to do anytime you're looking at a grid, you can look in the lower right in Ableton, and this is inside of a clip down in the lower right, which you can't see because of that waveform there, you know, or else on the arrangement view itself. And you can use these key commands. Command one will increase your grid resolution. Command two will decrease your grid resolution. Command three is, uh, nope. So let's let's do it together. Notice how mine is on off. See, mine says off. That's so I can slide stuff freely wherever I want it. So it's not on the grid. But if I hit Command Four, now I'm on a, now I'm on the grid. So now I now I can use com, now I can use Command One, Two, and Three to change that resolution. Yep. So no problem. So Command One will give me more grid. Two is less grid, like bigger chunks, and then three is triplets where applicable. Sometimes triplets won't fit on the screen or whatever, and so it just won't give you the command three. But yeah, especially for MIDI editing inside of that clip editor, getting command three happening. Is instead of you having to use your mouse to change the grid resolution, this shit is slow. So let's let's try um let's let's do a little audio check first. Let's see what's up. This is a long intro. Sound? Cool. So this is gonna be fun, guys. I'm gonna just start throwing some of my sound effects we just made into this track. So I'm going to go down to some new audio tracks on the bottom and I'm going to show you a couple audio editing tricks. That'll be fun. So I'm going to drop this on and hit command one a couple times and slide it right over to the chunk where I want it to play. Then I'll hit command two to get off the grid again. Now I'm going to hit plus and then the letter R. That's going to reverse that sound. And I'll even hit F to show fades and make a little fade in. Come on, girl. There we go. Oh, yeah. So that was kind of cool. Let's actually try that one more time. I'm trying to get the damn fades to show. I got to hit the letter A to change into my editing mode. And then I can do a little fade. Let's try that section one more time. Yeah, that's a sweet little laser blast. Let's turn that up and put some delay and reverb on there, eh? Here we go. That's pretty cool. I don't want the delay, though. That was distracting. Just the reverb. Let's open that browser up and grab another one. Let's head over here and maybe drop this thing right here and reverse that one. Mine this out here a little bit. 
I'm going to duplicate it and reverse it again. Yeah. Let me turn my webcam off real quick. Oh, you guys got to mute your mic. One, one thing we got to watch out for is everyone's got to keep their mic muted with this listen to because the audio movers thing is loud and full res. And if you don't have headphones on, it just becomes a total cacophony in the stream. So check it out. See how I drop these on here? Let's hit the letter S and solo them really quick. That's pretty cool. I'm going to turn that up a little more. I mean, good luck making that with a, with serum. You know, here, let me let me shift click on these and hit the arrow to the right once. Now listen to my bass drop. This is going to happen right at the beat. In fact, maybe we'll have it do that like a count. Two counts before the drop. Let's try it. I'm going to hit S again and take it out of solo. <laughs> That's pretty cool, but I'm going to move it a little closer. So here's where Command 4 is really nice, because I'll just zoom in with a plus key and just slide around. Not everything should be on the grid all the time. It's just boring, right? Let's try that now. Oh, yeah, right there. That little pickup. It's like an eighth note early. That really worked. So that was pretty neat. There's not a lot of headroom in my mix. I'd like to turn that up a little more. I'm going to try and throw a little glue compressor on there, which is kind of unorthodox. And of course, I already have one on my default track. So I'm going to pump it up a little bit. That's pretty cool. I went a little over the top, but yeah, you get this idea. I'm going to do one more. Open that browser. Again, that's Option Command B. Well, that one had a bunch of bass in it. Let's try this one. I'll get back on the grid with Command 4 for you grid resolution fans. Here's S. And that one is cool. I can hit the letter Z and blow that clip up. You know that one? X to minimize it and then Z to blow it up. That's especially tricky when you're doing little fades and fun stuff like that, you know? So let's hit X and fold that up and decide really where do we want that. I think I want this one right on the uh, right on the drop. Just a big old blast. Maybe we'll put a different one in front of it. But reverse this one. This is another cool trick. Maybe we'll stretch it for a while. You know this trick? Shift, pull. Now I'm stretching sounds. Yeah, so if you use shift on the timeline and your clip is in warp mode, you can just stretch sounds right on the track. That is also muy bueno. So now I can go ahead and put a fade, big old gnarly fade in on that one. And since I stretched the complete shit out of that, I might go to the clip envelopes and adjust, maybe automate the grain size or something. Let's get out of that complex pro mode, put in this textures mode. Listen to this. Here we go. I'm going to get faded a little faster. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's fucking cool. Let's adjust the grain size a little bit for fun. I think I might make a shape here. You can highlight amounts of envelopes and just right click and make a little shape. That'd be cool. Let's tweak that grain size. Just tweak it. What's your grains like? I want to meet that bad. Here we go. Right on the one there. Let's slide that thing over and see how it sounds in the mix. There's so much shit going on in this mix already. It's kind of like a maybe I should have grabbed a song that was a little less busy. But in this case, you just get an idea of how I'm going to start applying those sounds. And you know, your no no two bars of your song will be the same when you have a whole library of similar sounds. And then you're able to use techniques like fading, stretching, reversing, warping, consolidating. You know, I feel like in many ways, modern audio production happens like this, you know, micro editing audio waveforms on the timeline. I'm still a really big fan of jamming and using the session view and experimenting and just kicking shit down the stairs and seeing what happens. But ultimately it's got to boil down to a workflow that yields meaningful content. And so this is where recording the sounds, making sound libraries, so you can actually apply the sounds instead of looking at the timeline and looking at MIDI notes. 
hate that feeling. So like, you know, get the arrangement part with the notes down and then start flipping that sound, that whole song on its side and looking at the sounds themselves and how you can make them better. Let's um, let's just listen to the track now. I'll let it play through the next drop and we'll I'll shut up then. So I thought it was maybe especially pertinent just to show that little last section because there's just a ton of little micro audio edits that are happening throughout the whole thing. And a lot of times those are just sounds coming from my modular synth or sounds from my chicken coop or whatever, you know, just recording sounds and throwing them in there. But layering them in the sampler to make more interesting results, adding a little bit of modulation and some FM, some effects that's going to glue your field recordings and weird sound ideas together to make things more interesting. And then ultimately, when you're looking at the timeline and chopping it up, you'll be able to control it really specifically, you know? Like, these are all little flips and reverses and fades that are all happening to the beat, you know? And then meanwhile, these squishy sounds are also happening in response to those sounds. And I have opportunities wherever, okay, this is going to be completely gone. You know, silence is like the most important thing you can say as a music producer. And uh, you can't make silence happen looking at a bunch of virtual instruments. you got to bake it and then erase it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, well, no, I guess I'll just open this up for questions. I just got to share a little sketch, show off how I'm using audio chopping and stuff. Still always starting my sketches on the session view, just kicking shit around, but flipping it over here and chopping it up and adding my one shots and my non-repeating layers to keep it interesting the whole time so it's not just some loop, but it actually feels like a journey, like an adventure. Discover your own sound at America's leading digital audio academy, Slam Academy. An Ableton certified training center, Slam offers in-depth courses in sound design, mixing and mastering, DJing, and more in Minneapolis, Denver, and online only at www.slamacademy.com.